It's good to see e each of you here today. A special welcome to those of you uh, gathered online. Um, and, and also a special welcome to anyone who is, is new or visiting. Um, and, and anybody who hasn't been around in a while. It's, it's great to have uh, more and more people back in person. Uh, so glad that you are here today. Today, uh, as Jamie uh, mentioned, we are... Uh, uh, continuing in the book of Hebrews. We will be uh, for a while, but we are wrapping up the first part of the book of Hebrews and this series uh, where we have been encouraged to hold fast despite uh, whatever difficult times we may be experiencing and going through. You know, we're, we're not sure really who wrote this uh, this 13 chapter book of the Bible, we, or, or where it was exactly first delivered, uh, but it's pretty clear what was going on in the spiritual lives of those first folks who received uh, this, uh, these written words, which have the feel really of a, of a, of a powerful sermon. And although nearly 2,000 years and half of a world separate us from the original recipients of this message, it seems to me that the book of Hebrews could have been written just for us. Uh, Hebrews with, was shared with Christians who were burdened. They were burdened by suffering, burdened by things not going the way that they had expected when they began to follow Jesus. I mean, God's kingdom had, had, hadn't come as quickly as they originally anticipated. And, and they were feeling the pressure from their surrounding culture to go back to their former way of life, uh, their, their life before they knew Christ. They were being tempted to abandon their faith. Uh, we are tempted all the time too, aren't we? Uh, I, I, we're tempted every time trials come our way, every time things don't go the way that we had planned. Uh, on Friday, our family returned from a, a week-long uh, vacation in downtown Chicago. It was great. Uh, it was wonderful. Uh, uh, but, but a few days the week before that, uh, the, the kids and I, uh, my kids are 12 and 13 years old, uh, we went on uh, kind of a, a, a dad-kid adventure uh, to Turkey Run State Park in Indiana for some uh, long hikes and canoeing together. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, the biggest adventure was our 10-mile canoe trip that turned quickly into an 18-mile <laughs> canoe trip. Um, and uh, it, all because we we missed the the getting off point and in the the steady downfall of rain, uh, so you can you can imagine this uh, soaking wet, completely wet. Uh, we were looking for a bridge. We had passed the bridge, but we were looking for another bridge because we knew this the ending point was at a bridge, and and it never came. The bridge never came. We. We ev around uh, kind of the, the river was twisty and turning and around every twist and turn. We, we were hoping to see that bridge um, and then we didn't and, and we had struggled on through uh, that next straightaway until we got to another turn and hoped for a bridge. <laughs> it, just, it, it never came. We were discouraged every time it wasn't there. And, and uh, of course, it was because we had passed the bridge already, um, which was totally my fault. I, I miscounted the, the number of bridges. Uh, but, but when things get tough, uh, we can choose to trust God and keep going, or we could say, enough is enough. I quit. I am out of here, God. You know, we, we, we might be tempted. We're, I think we're regularly tempted to abandon our faith whenever following Jesus in our present-day culture gets difficult. I mean, it, is, it is hard work to be a person of integrity, lo loving God, uh, living your life uh, under the, the authority of God's word, following God's ways, uh, loving people who, who just don't want to follow God's ways. You know, it, it's difficult to be ridiculed uh, time and time again everywhere you turn. It, it is. Being faithful is, is not easy. Uh, it is really easy to get weary, to become burdened. And sometimes in, in this weariness, I, I, I see people kind of 
fall away from the church. And as a pastor, that, that really, that, that breaks my heart when that happens. But even more often, I think we're, we're tempted to stop trusting God, but to still go through all the religious motions, right? We're still here. We, we've just become apathetic and, and spiritual shells of our former selves. You know, Hebrews was written to those facing the temptation to walk away from faith. And the overarching message has been the name of, of our series, Hold Fast. Hold fast to your faith. Uh, and so far in Hebrews, we've been encouraged to hold fast to faith because Jesus is God. He, he's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than our present troubles. And he has spoken his word of salvation to us. Uh, we've also been encouraged to hold fast because Jesus, just like the song uh, that, that the band just sang and performed for us, uh, because Jesus was fully human. He, he was human like us in every way, except that he was perfectly obedient to his Father in heaven. He, he died our death and invites us to be raised to glory with him. We've been encouraged to hold fast to faith because we can hold fast to faith even in our failures. Even in the face of death, we can hold fast to faith because Jesus conquered death. But we've also been warned. So there's been encouragement and there's been warning. Right? Warned to not drift away from faith, to not miss this word of salvation. Warned that if we don't hold fast to faith, then just as we learned last week from chapter 3, which Bonnie taught on, that we will miss out on what God offers us, just like the Israelites did. And in, in the passage you just heard read, uh, we learned what we will receive if we hold fast. If we hold fast to faith in Christ, then God's promise to us is that we will enter his rest. And if you are a typical person today, finding rest sounds pretty appealing, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And most of our lives are defined by the word busy, not rest. Uh, a study recently conducted by Harvard Business School found that 94% of professionals work at least 50 hours per week, and 50% of professionals work at least 65 hours per week. And things are moving in the wrong direction. You know, this is crazy considering 1928, there was a famous British economist named John Keynes who noted the trends of technological improvements actually shortening the work day uh, 100 years ago. And, and he predicted that by now, our wealth and our technology would permit us to get this work 15 hour work weeks and spend the rest of our time doing whatever we want to do, leisure, right? I mean, can you, can you imagine that? It makes me laugh. W wouldn't that be nice? But the truth is, the fact is technology has done just the opposite, hasn't it? You know, if, if you have a smartphone, and I have mine right now, uh, so that I can uh, see the folks who are joining us online uh, a little bit, uh, uh, and I had it on my vacation, too. Uh, if you have a smartphone, research says that you're connected to your work on average 13 and a half hours, not per week, but per day. <laughs> we don't have rest. We are weary. Even if we're not working outside the home, which I know many of us worked in our homes uh, much of the last year, uh, the pace of our lives is frenetic. M most of us don't know how to let go. And the sad, one of the saddest part about all of it to me is we're teaching the same thing to our kids. Um, you know, researchers have dubbed a new phrase for um, uh, families in our society today, um, and uh, over-parenting. We have our kids in this activity and that activity, and we are constantly busying them with, uh, with more and more in order to help them 
you know, we justify by saying it's helping them get a leg up. It's helping them improve their resume, get better grades, to get into the best colleges and to make it onto the best teams. You know, top to bottom, we are the most workaholic society in history. And the result is we are tired, worn out people, burnt out people. E- even when we rest, gosh, we, we do something enjoyable and, and we, we make it a competition with other people's leisure time. Even when we slow down our bodies, many of us find it impossible to slow down our minds. And if you don't believe me, I mean, think about it the next time you're trying to get to sleep and your mind won't stop going. The voice inside our head keeps saying things like, you aren't being very productive. You are falling behind. You forgot this. You forgot that. And somewhere along the, the way in our individualistic society, we bought into a lie. We, we, we bought into a lie that our self-worth is determined by how much we do how much we produce or achieve or the status we attain uh, from our victories. We've uh, attached our identity to our accomplishments from our work in life, and we're teaching our kids the same. So we pile more and more onto our plates thinking that we will be worth more if we do. We think busy will make us more valuable, more loved by others. And, and even in the church sometimes, we, we think that it'll make us more valuable and loved by God. Well, can you imagine? Can you imagine the problems that would result in a people, in a culture, in a society with this kind of a mindset? You don't have to imagine too long, do you? I mean, really, we are living out a lot of the problems in our own lives. Low self-worth, constant competition, mounting stress from a perfectionistic mentality, which ultimately leads to depression and crashing, broken relationships from overwork, and, and, and constant judgment of others. and and being judged by others. I mean, can you imagine the problems that putting your self-worth into your achievements and what you produce does to you when maybe there's an economic downturn and you lose your job? Or you retire or you somehow become disabled or injured and can't do the things that you used to be able to do, can't produce the things you used to be able to produce, where is your value then? You know, we desperately need this rest that the scriptures speak of. So let's, let's uh, take a look at these verses to see what this rest is that God promises to us. Did you know that in the passage that Jamie just read, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, the word rest is repeated 15 times in the first 11 verses. Uh, But but really, it's used to describe some some different levels, different understandings of this rest that that God offers. So it's, it's pretty easy to kind of get lost and confused or to misunderstand what the author of the sermon is trying to say. So let's spend a little bit of time breaking it down. In fact, now would be a perfect time to, if you have your your Bible with you, to uh, open it up and take a look at it. This is one of those that it might actually help uh, to see. And we'll we'll try to have the uh, relevant passages uh, on the screen too. But but first, our context. At the end of chapter 3, Uh, We're encouraged to hold fast to our faith so that we don't end up like the children of Israel who didn't listen to God's voice. They rebelled and they never entered the rest of God. Uh, The very last verse of chapter 3 says, So we see that they were not able to enter enter God's rest uh, because of their unbelief. But the very next verses say, Therefore... Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, 
Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we have, we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. We, lo- we learn right away from this that that promise of God's rest is it, it's still there for us. It still stands for us as it did for them. Uh, of course, they missed out because they didn't listen to God. They didn't have faith that expressed itself through obedience. Only if we have that kind of faithful trust can we enter his rest. And more on that in a bit. But what is this rest that we are invited to enter? Well, let's look at the rest of verse 3 all the way through verse 5. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but you, to, to take a look at this. In, in this passage, there are, are really two levels of rest mentioned. Um, in, in the middle part of verse 3, uh, it's labeled here 3b on the screen. Uh, and, and then again in verse 5, when God said they would never enter my rest. Uh, in, in these verses, it's really talking about entering the the Israelites, it's pointing back to the Israelites entering the promised land. Uh, If you recall this story from the Old Testament, uh, uh, Moses had led God's people out of slavery uh, and and bondage in Egypt. By the way, what was it that they were uh, led out of? What, what What did their slavery consist of? overwork. (laughs) You think about that? They they could never rest. They had to work all the time. They were slave labor. They never got to rest. So after being delivered from slavery to freedom, freedom from overwork, God had Moses lead them to the promised land of Canaan where they could live under God's law, which provided them rest rest from their constant labors. Of course, the writer of Hebrews here quotes again uh, Psalm 95, uh, which uh, was quoted multiple times in the previous chapter too. Um, And Psalm 95 was written at least 200 years after Moses had had led the people out of slavery in Egypt. And, And it was to remind us of that first generation of freed Israelites that they rebelled and they didn't enter the promised land because of their lack of trust in God. Uh, They didn't enter that rest, uh, the rest of the promised land, until that generation had died and Joshua led the next generation into this land of promise. Uh, But then, uh, so that's the first kind of rest, entering into the promised land. Then in verses, uh, the end of verse 3 Um, labeled here verse uh, uh, 3c and verse 4 we see that the that the rest is something more than just being overworked how do we know this well this this rest we read existed from the beginning of creation it's related to god's rest at the very beginning of time after he had created Uh, God's rest during creation. This is the Sabbath rest that you and I are invited into. Now, this is fascinating to consider. God resting. Um, You you ever think about that? What what was God resting from? Was God overworked? Was God weary? Weary? No, God doesn't get tired. God God rested not out of weariness or overwork. If you look back to the very first couple chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, you see that after God created humans in his image on day six of creation, God was satisfied. He called it very good. And then when he was satisfied and it was all completed, he rested and called that rest holy. God's rest wasn't an outward rest for the body from overwork. It was an inward rest 
of contentment, of letting go. It was rest for the soul. Rest that when we truly enter it allows us to set our work down and be satisfied, content, even even if in our fallenness that work is never complete. And it never is, is it? I mean, that, that's, that's our justification for overwork to keep on going because it's not done yet. It's not done yet. I still have to tie this up. I still have to, I gotta finish this. Uh, it's never complete. Even in our fallenness though, when it's never complete, we can enter that rest of contentment. It's an inner rest that God offers. And this is the kind of rest that that many of us never attain. And hear me on this. We can never attain that kind of rest, inner rest, contentment in our soul when we've based our identity on how much we accomplish. When, When we are so restless that we cannot stop our output, our doing, in order to enjoy the work of our hands and the the, the beautiful gift of God's world around us, then we are missing the Sabbath rest that God blessed and made holy for us. You know, many many of us, I mean, let's be honest, we've gotten pretty good at resting from overwork. We take a day off. We go on vacation. Uh, some of you are on vacation right now, tuning in online. That's awesome. Uh, I'm glad. But inside, we're still slaves. Slaves to our own expectations and the expectations of others. Uh, Our souls are not at rest. We aren't content or satisfied with ourselves or with what we've done. We, We might have the outer rest, We might have been trained well to do that, but many of us don't have that inner rest that we need, rest that God invites us into as a part of his promise to us. Well, let's briefly look at uh, the next few verses, six, seven, and eight. The, the, the writer here states that the children of Israel did not enter God's rest. They missed it because of their disobedience, because of their lack of faith. Uh, But God has said another time to enter that rest. And that time, uh, at least according to Psalm 95, is today. It's now. Verse 8 goes on to say that even though Joshua uh, did eventually lead God's people into the promised land, that there is still more rest to be had. In other words, the promised land, the writer here is saying, the promised land wasn't the end all be all. That wasn't the promised rest. It was one level of the promised rest, but it's not the promised rest that God still offers us today. There is still another rest yet to come. Now, now verses 9 through 11, here the writer is saying that this special rest is still awaiting God's people. So then he encourages us, so let's do our best to enter this rest. We don't want to miss it, but how do we do it? How do we enter rest? that kind of rest, the the kind of rest that verse 10 talks about, the kind of rest that God experienced after creating the world, a rest of contentment, a rest of satisfaction, an inner rest where our, our souls are finally at peace. How do we enter that rest? Well, this passage shows how it was that the Israelites missed out on God's rest. Uh, it was in their disobedience which showed their lack of faith. This is mentioned multiple times here in this small section uh, at the end of chapter three, then again in, in verse two, verse six, and verse 11 of chapter four. We made it, it's made clear. They missed out because of their disobedience, uh, because of their lack of faith. Uh, but how do we enter this rest with faith expressed through obedience? What does that look like? Well, let me read aloud to you these next two verses that are are somewhat well known. You will recognize these. But in this context, I think it it comes across as, uh, uh, it reveals a painful truth. Verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates 
even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The first step to entering God's rest is to be laid bare before him. To be exposed by the word of God. Particularly to have our innermost thoughts and desires revealed to God. And here's what I think will be revealed to us as it's already revealed to God. Uh, at least this is what I've learned about myself when I um, am most honest with myself and exposed and naked before God. I find that there is something deeply wrong with me. And I'm not just talking about being a Cubs fan. Um, um, there, I'm really not even talking about any sinful patterns or behaviors, although as I let God's word mold and shape me, I'm confronted with those two. That's not what I'm talking about, though. What, what I'm really talking about is even, even the good stuff that I do. And this is killer. Even the good stuff that I do reveals my brokenness. You see, it's possible to follow every letter of the law, but to do so with the wrong motivations, with the wrong heart. I mean, you've seen this. If you're a parent or a teacher, you've been around younger kids, you, you look in the mirror, you, you, you see, you can pout, you can, you can do all the right, you can do all the things you're supposed to do with the wrong, with the horrible attitude, out of spite, out of self-justification, with any sort of motivation. Sometimes even the good stuff that I do is a way of justifying myself to make myself look good to others or, or to feel good inside. Or even sometimes, if I'm honest, to appease some sense of guilt that I feel in my relationship with God. And, and, and I, can, I can confidently say that my identity is firmly rooted in God's love for me in Christ. D despite that, sometimes my inner desires and my motivations betray my brokenness. You know, when you are laid bare before God after having been sifted by his word, you will recognize at least a couple of things about yourself. I first, and most obviously, on, on kind of a surface level, you'll see where your behaviors do not conform to God's ways as revealed by God's word. When you are exposed, those areas of disobedience will be clearly revealed. But secondly, and more deeply, you will be confronted with the motives behind even the good stuff that you do. Your good works and all the ways that you build your identity on your productivity and your accomplishments. When even your outward obedience is done for self-justifying reasons. And you will feel like you've just been cut by a double-edged sword. You will feel exposed. And verse 13 says, nothing is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. Really, we're only hiding the truth from ourselves. You know, interesting language used here in verse 13 for the word exposed. Uh, this is the same root word that is used when describing an animal sacrifice that was laid before the altar in the, the priestly rituals of the Old Testament. And in his notes 
on this passage, John Wesley, the the founder of the Methodist movement, said this about it. He said, it's plainly alluding to the sacrifices of the law, which were first flayed. And then, as the Greek word literally means, cleft asunder through the neck and the backbone, so that everything within and without is exposed to open view. And the point of this passage is clear. If you want to enter God's rest, the truth about yourself must be totally, entirely exposed. And when you're painfully exposed in this manner, you will find that your efforts, all of your good works, are not enough. You're still guilty. You'll find that you are utterly helpless to enter God's rest on your own merit. So how then can you enter God's rest if you can't do it on your own? The answer is you enter God's rest not through your own efforts, but through the work of of Jesus Christ. And this uh, really does get into next week's message a bit, but the rest of chapter 4 ends this way. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. On this Memorial Day weekend, when we rightfully pause as, as a United States, as a nation, to remember the fallen, of those who laid down their lives, they gave their life uh, for our freedom. We especially remember Jesus. Jesus, who this passage calls our high priest, A high priest leads the people into the presence of God. He was himself stripped naked and laid bare on the cross. He was exposed in the most gruesome and horrible way. And he endured all of that pain so that you and I would be able to receive the mercy of God and enter God's promised rest for our souls, which we could not enter into ourselves. And this rest of God has um, both present here and now components as well as future and not yet realized components. And I'm not going to get into that uh, so much today. But the scripture says that, that that rest is here today and is still waiting for God's people. You are invited into God's rest today in this life where you can have peace, the peace that comes from letting go and having contentment in the work of Jesus But it also means that if you hold fast and cling to faith, enduring until the end, then you will be able to completely rest from your labors, from all the trials and tribulations of this life for all eternity. That is God's invitation and promise for you and for me. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, when we're honest, we are, are weary. Weary and burdened. 
We are constantly tempted to put our trust in our own efforts, to think that our own accomplishments will make us more worthy of love and of praise from others, including you. But you know, God, you know what folly that is. You know that we are only fooling ourselves and that we will never enter your promised rest if we cling to our own works in that way. So Father, we pray that by the power of your Spirit in us that you would take this knowledge and understanding that we grasp with our minds and and use it, Lord, to transform our hearts, to transform our behaviors, to help us let go of our own works, to help us find contentment, not in ourselves, but in the work of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross on our behalf. Lord, help us learn satisfaction in his efforts so that we can experience your promised rest, rest for our very souls, both today and for all time, forever. For we pray it in the name of Jesus who made it possible. And all of God's people agreed and said, amen.